Can you turn this on? Great. So, this is a talk about Trinomox. More specifically, about interaction based testing, which is where we tend to use Rhinomox. Now, by show of hands, how many of you know or have used Rhinomox? Okay, how many of you have not? One, two, three, four. Okay. So, the way this is going to, to go, we are going to do a couple of demonstrations of how to use Rhinomox. And then we are actually going to start a by taking Q by doing basically Q and A, seeing what you are interested in. So if you're not familiar, my name is Oren Aini. I'm also the creator of Finomox. So ideally I should know what I'm talking about here. And just because I feel like it, I need a scenario. I need some sort of interesting scenario to talk about. Who wants to offer one? No one? Yes? Okay. Something else? Yes? Anyone has an idea? Yes? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, keep that as a question because I want a scenario to use just unit test. Yes? QA. I want a scenario to do the testing example, the intro. What? Now, where did that example come from? Okay. Uh, admittance service. Uh, uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Uh, Prisoners inventory. Good enough. Okay, so what we're doing now, we're just creating the test scenario. We don't care about anything here. So this is the code that I want to test. Well, not really. What? Great. So this is the code that I now want to test. And what I want to test is actually very simple. I want to test every code path in this code. 
Tell me how to do that. How about this? When we are trying to add a prisoner that has bad documentation, we just throw the, throw the party out. We don't want you here if you have bad documentation. Are they actually playing soccer out there? Okay. I have better raised my voice. Okay. Anyway. So... I'm going to write this test. Any advice? No advice. Okay, now what I want is the dog checker. Generate a stub. And Out of prisoner is anything toes invalid operation exception. to call admittance dot admit prisoner new prisoner. What should happen now? What did they just do? Well the first thing that they do was to create the dog checker. This is a stub. We don't care about the definition right now. Second, I created an admitted service, an instance of admitted service. Pass it another stub which we really don't care about. And then we ask the uh, admission service to the, the document checker, whenever we call you to verify that the documentation is valid, what should you do? What should you do? Return false. And then we actually call the admit prisoner. If you run this piece of code, what will it do? Any guesses? We have a passing test. Let's see what's actually going on. See that? That's really interesting. This can only happen if document checker return false, which it did. 
don't care about doing that kind of stuff. No. Okay? This is, in a very simple terms, what mocking is all about. I'm able to take an existing implementation or just an interface and force it to do what I want it to do. Now, I could obviously have just created a class that always returned false. But you know what? That isn't really flexible enough. Because I want to be able to configure my instance, the mocked instance, to do what I want it to do. Let's see another thing. Now I want to say, when all docs are right, would put in jail. And we start from this, and now we're telling that return true. How can we verify that this will work? Any idea? Well, the answer is quite interesting. Let's look at this now. Will this test pass? How many people said this will pass? You cheat, it's already passed. But let's see something more interesting. If we don't call this, what is going to happen? We expected it to be called to jail with a prisoner to be called once, but it was called zero times. That's bad. But uh, we, that means that we have a fair test. But it also means that it actually works. So now, what have we actually tested so far? Can you tell me? We certainly tested something, but usually when we are talking about let's test, we are talking about doing asserts on state. After executing A, then the state should be B. After executing A under this condition, the status should be C, etc., etc. In this case, what we are actually testing isn't a state of the isn't the state of the object. This is actually the interaction of this of the object under test of the class under test with its collaborator. I want you to think about typical O system. Each class isn't actually doing much. We use delegation, we use aggregation to a, a combine classes that each does only a single thing and combine them into a system that with each, co with each class with its collaborator help to provide the full functionality of the system. And in many cases, this is what we need to do. So interaction-based testing literally allows us to test the interaction, the method calls. It allows us to change the way that the code behaves in certain ways, because we can now create a fake instance and tell that fake instance, literally program 
the track instance how to behave. Again, this is nothing that we couldn't have done on our own. The major difference is that we could actually turn that and uh, uh, look at that in a way that means that we don't have the burden of creating a fake instance all the time. We can just be free with what we're, with what we're doing. I didn't have to create a whole new class here. When I did this, nothing really changed versus this. Now, I'm hoping that any of you who doesn't know Mocking by now have got it, at least the major concept, because right now uh, I want to stop and take questions from the audience about how they use Ranomox and what problems have they found. And you had one with study classes. And you had one some over there. Okay. What do you say? Ordering and your expectation. That's interesting. More? More questions? Can't hear you? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Raising events. Yes? Yeah. I'm not sure that I understand. Okay. Hey, hey, hey. Okay. Uh, arrange act assert. Mo. Yes. I'm not, can you give me the scenario? You want to mock only part of the class, only single method? I'm not sure that I understand. Okay. I'm not sure that I understand. What do you mean a class and another class? Sure. Isn't that what we just did here? Yeah, okay, okay. That's fine. No problem. Mo. Yes? What? I couldn't hear you. Sorry. Okay. More? Okay. More? More stuff? Good enough for now. Oh, yeah, sorry. Okay, we deal with that. One last question. You have to raise your voice. Okay, so let's start by hitting them one by one. How to mock static, static classes? It's very easy, you don't. Uh, at least you don't with Ranomox. You can use a tool like TapMock to do that by mocking directly the static class. 
what we tend to do in most cases, and a good example would be daytime now, is something like this. Just doing minor cleanup. Great. Anyone follows what I just did? We have the notion of a system clock now. And that translates directly into the static class. This is the adapter pattern. What this means is that in my test, I can very easily make decisions and mock by just mocking I system clock. This is generally considered to be a best practice because now you're not actually tied to the actual implementation. And now you can start refactoring the actual implementation to give you more flexibility. But eventually the answer for this question is that either you don't mock it or you create an adapter on top of that. You have something to say? Okay, that you raise your hand. Does this answer your question? Great. Ordering, who asked that? Yes, what's the question exactly? So let's do something like that. For some reason, you really care about that, so we want to validate this. Something like that, okay? And this is obviously a mistake. So, what we are doing, what we are, where is the fixture? Here it is. We'll call a begin and then commit. Now, this is a fairly uncommon f uh, usage. I don't know, why do you need that? Okay. And because this is fairly unusual requirement, we have to use, we don't have helper classes for that, helper methods. So what we are doing is mocks.create mock itx.
what I just did was explicitly tell it these methods have to call in this order. And now, a new admittance service. That would be good. And let's say that what I want, that's good enough. Now, if I try to execute that, the test is going to fail. It's going to fail with a very interesting problem. An order method call. The expected call is ITX begin. Interesting. That was ITX commit. Oh, of course. I'm doing it the wrong way. If we try to repeat the test case now, it is going to fail. That's interesting. Oh, yeah. Of course. Let me just fix this. And now the test will work. Okay? You see that, that it passed? We have a passing test with ordering. Raising events. Raising events. Okay. Uh, so now what we're doing is mock repository, generates tab, I notify property change. Notice something interesting. I notify property change has a single method, property change. And what I want now is Second, let's see what's going on. That's interesting. Oh, of course. And good enough.
Let's see what's going to happen now. And this actually failed. Why did it fail? Because this is not the right type. Property change event. And now it's successfully passed. But let's see what we're actually doing. So the first thing that we are doing, we are creating a stub of iNotify prop property change. Second thing, we wire ourselves to the property, just as we would do on any, thing, any other thing. Then we actually do something very strange. We call raise, and we have to somehow get the property. One of the major things that a, a Rhino, Rhino Mox is trying to do is to allow always type safety. So as much as, much as possible, we are trying to use strongly type uh, stuff. So that's why we have the sequence of property change plus equal uh, null. Then we pass the, the arguments. And this line will actually raise the event, which calls, which calls, calls this guy, which means that this was called. Who asked this question? Answer? Yes. Okay, so yes, yeah, so in the old version of Final Mock in three three point four, it was actually a much more complex. I think you have to call get event tracer and raise the event appropriately. It wasn't fun. I think this is much much easier. Okay. What is AAA? Arrange, act, as assert. Who can tell me? Anyone? Uh, okay. It's the second one. What? Yes. So arrange, act, assert goes like this. It's the way to structure tests, a very natural way of structuring tests. First, we arrange all the, pre all the precondition. Then, we perform the action under, under test. Valid and put, admit prisoner to, to the prison. Finally, we assert that the appropriate behavior or, st or state has been achieved. Does it make sense? Let's see it with code. Okay, who can point me? You know what, this is really bad. I will tell you why this is bad. Because the first two lines are the arranged part. 
then we have the dog checker stub. This is also part of the range, but this is a bit twisty because in this part we are actually arranging that when you call this method it will return this value. Finally we have the act. What line is act? What? 62. The line mark in red. This is the action. Where is the assert? In line 61. That's why I say it's a bit screwy. Let's try to write a more a cleaner uh, test. And which obviously doesn't really mean anything. That is much more understandable. That is how most test case goes. We force arrange what we are doing by creating the object under test and any of the dependencies. Then we act, do the action under test. Finally, we assert about what we are actually doing. Who asked, who asked about AA? Okay. The difference between AAA can be easily seen when we're actually talking about the previous syntax. In the previous syntax, as you can see here, we have to work in a different manner. First, we create the, uh, the mock instances. Then we have to manually move in line 38 from record method to replay method from record phase to replay phase. Only then can we actually execute the code. And you can notice, where is my assert here? I don't actually have an assert. The assert is here, sort of. This is where we set up the expectation. So. That was a big problem for a long time. That it was actually fairly hard to develop, to develop tests that you put the assert before the action in this way. What we're doing now with the AAA is much, much simpler. Make sense? Great. Partials. Partials are fun. How long 
is this method going to take? How much? Is this acceptable test performance? Let's say that there is something here that we really don't want to, to execute. We still want this method to be called. We still want to, to test this method. We just don't want this to be called because it's doing something. Here's an interesting way of approaching this problem. We call this thing Now let's see how long this is going to take us It passed in almost zero time what we actually did, we created a partial mock. A partial mock is, a, is an instance, <coughs> is a class where we literally decided this method, this method should not be executed. Not a real implementation. We can actually now call and make an assertion here. And the test will still pass, again, in zero time. Because we have dynamically overridden that class and that method and changed it to point to us. It's slightly hard to start thinking about our classes in this way, where we can actually just change them on the fly based on how we're doing things. But this is literally what we just did. We decided, yeah, I don't really want to execute this code. Let's override it at runtime. Make sense to you guys? Great. Next. Testing web services with mocks. Who asked that? OK, great. Tell me what you meant. Okay. I think there are more stuff here going on than just smoking. Okay? More related to test design and what you're actually try trying to test. For your description, it looks like what you're actually trying to do is to test the web service itself. And in that case, I would just instantiate the web service class in the actual uh, test and call method on that. On the other hand, it may be that you're trying to test code that uses this web service. And if that is the case, that most certainly you can create an interface on top of that. And that's a usually safe operation to do. Mocking are almost always used in the context of unit tests. So that's how I'm answering it. OK. Who asked about mocking classes? To somewhere up here? Who asked about mocking classes? No one. You? You cannot do that. 
Rhino mock will mock the following thing. Interface method, virtual functions. That's it. That is an explicit, explicit design decision made by me. Because if it's not extensible, it should not be mockable. As, as simple as that. There are tools, again, like TypeMock, that will let you do that. But not, uh, not Rhinomox. And extension methods, who has that? OK. One second, I will take more questions in a bit. Extension methods are static methods. Again, they are not mockable. Yes. Yeah. One second. Can you tell them to shut up, please, or just lower the voices? Because I really want to try to compete with them. And I'm really trying not to. OK, yes, please say now. This is what we are doing here. You see that? You can make it a uh, protected virtual, basically. But that's about it. If it's a private method, then it's part of the uh, uh, implementation detail, and you don't have access to that. It's a unit test, absolutely. Why? It's testing what? Not really. I don't, I don't consider that. It's something that you have to do. In this case, we don't want to make the test wait for 10 seconds. You had a question? Yeah. If, OK. If this was like this. Like that? How would this be set? This is real code, remember. It has to be set in some manner. In the what? Who is going to set it? Oh, you mean something like this? Something like that. You cheat. Get properties surface. Get set method. And I want the cleaner, and I want new, and next I want the surface. This will still work. This will still pass. Basically, the answer to your question is that you cannot do that, so you have to cheat. And again, we have to consider what are we trying to do. Design for, for making testing easy is a value. 
You shouldn't have to fight your code base to do that. Remember that. Because I see a lot of the questions that I hear, how can I test my code without making changes to that? And you know what? I can give you answers like this one. Those are not good answers. Because you come from the premise, I don't want to change my code. That's a problem. Because the type of code that you get from, from writing tests like this tends to be much cleaner. It tends to be easier to read, easier to write. It tends to deal with very small increments of the problem. It also tends to be much, much easier to maintain over the long term. Okay. Now it's the time to gather more questions. Yes. Great question. More questions? Yeah. Okay. Yes? Yes? More? Would I create performance testing while unit testing? Uh, I don't think that I would do perf testing as part of unit testing. Mo I wouldn't worry about very small tasks for in performance anyway. But uh, to answer your question, I might use the unit testing tools to do that, but I wouldn't call it unit testing. And okay, so we have a mockable table that just fall apart apparently whenever I get close enough. Uh, so to answer your questions, no, I wouldn't use that. Maybe I will use, uh, maybe I write a small test just to show what the perf is. But generally, I wouldn't bother. I would just write a small application and uh, use something like uh, JetBrains, JetBrains.Race, to see what the performance implications are. Yes? Can parent class? You cannot mock, um, if I understand correctly, you want to mock the parent class of an object. That is not something that has any meaning in the terms of the right time uh, uh, aspect. You can create a partial of the, the class that you want to test and uh, override all the methods from the subclass, from the base class. That's possible, yes. But not what you're trying to do. Yes. I cannot hear what, what you're saying. Can you come down a bit so I can hear you better? Isn't this what we did here? Talk about something like that? Oh, you want to, to mock this guy? No, you cannot do that. You can mock this guy, but not, uh, not just part of that. And the reason for why you cannot do that is fairly involved and complex, but whatever. More questions? Okay, so we do iterative questions, I guess. Okay. Static, dynamic, partial, and stops. 
I think that at this point I'm also supposed to say omai. Okay. Hey, sorry, it's not static, it's streak. So it's streak mocks are mocks that will only work as long as you follow the script. So think about that for a second. I'm going I'm going to give you a mock a mock object. If that mock object was programmed to expect to to get called from that you will call its admit prisoner method. That's what it's know that you should do. Instead you go and say, okay, uh, get number of prisoners. If you use a, a, a strict mock, it's going to freak out. Whoa, you call method that I don't know. I wasn't told about this method. You know, like those annoying bureaucrats in the government? What do you mean you don't have form 16A? Same thing with strict mock. If you don't do exactly the thing it's expected you to do, it's going to throw an exception. That's good and bad. It's good because it makes it very clear what's actually happening. It's bad because something that has no, no effect on the test may, cha may change the actual test. Because now we need to add, oh, I, we also need to call this guy, and we also need to call this guy. I generally don't recommend on using strict mox. What I do recommend is using dynamic mock. A dynamic mock is a hippie. It knows that you're supposed to call this method. And if you call this method, it will behave just like a strict mock. Give you the expected results. However, if we actually call a method that it doesn't know, it's going to say, oh, I don't know about this method. Who cares? Let's just make it happen anyway. And it will accept the method call and try to do something reasonable with that, usually by returning a default value. Now, partials, as we have seen, is a way to take a class, hold it in the air, strip up some implementation from it, say, this part is now mocked. Only this part. The rest is just a regular class. But this part is mock. And stubs are the super hippie. It literally does not care what you do to it. You cannot make it throw an exception in any normal circumstance. If it has a property, even if it's just an interface, it will behave as if the property has a back in store. If it have a, a method, the method will always return a, 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 a default value. Do whatever you want to me. I'm fine with that. Does it make it clear what, what the type of mocks are? Okay, I think so. It's very hard for me to see you. There is this huge projector directly into my eyes. A mocking async operation. You asked that, right? What did you mean? Who asked about mocking async operation? Oh, you there. Sorry. You generally don't need to mock both of them at the same time. And now we have some public interface. Uh, I So this is the async pattern in .NET. We have a begin operation that takes async callback and state and return async result. 
from our perspective, let's think about this type of code that we, that where we would use that. What would they do here? Right, this is just use the async code. No more key involved. What should they do? This is pretty standard, right? Now I want to test this. This is where things get actually very interesting. Let's see. Uh, we'll behave accordingly to async split. mock repository generate stub of I take long time now now I want to assert that it called the begin method that's very easy right set was called what happened when I execute this it passes but we only test half of that right what happened, I want to see that it also called the end method. And begin up, now, now. And now I want to make sure that stab set was call. Will this work? Let's see. It does. How it works? That's strange. I don't really know. Let's try to see. The magic, let me put it this way. Does everyone know up to here how it works? Is there anyone with questions about anything in these three lines? Good. Now, 
Now we're going to see something really interesting. We're making get argument for calls made on begin op with any arguments. Now, this is an array of arrays. What actually happened? This three tells me a list of all the parameters that I got from the uh, all the parameters that I got of, uh, uh, the, sorry, this three tells me a list of all the parameters that will call on the begin op operation. And then you see what the, what the first one is? We were only called once with two, with two parameters. One of them was a delegate to all begin op. The second one was null. Now, I'm extracting that and casting that to a callback function. Now I'm calling this. Now I have managed to call a private method. And I can assert, yes, end op was called. We've just seen it being called, right? Okay. We have time for two more questions. Either I totally amazed you, or you're not following me at all. Which is which? One of the things that you have to understand about Trinomox is that it's a very mature framework. It's now, I think, four or five years old. During the time frame, we actually had to accommodate a lot of scenarios. That is why it's so easy for me to uh, uh, give you answer for all the scenarios that you've given me so far. The problem is that as the complexity of the problem grows, so is the complexity of the solution. By the way, this is true for anything in the world. If you see something that gives you a flat, a flat curve for increasing complexity, look for where they are lying to you, because they are. So there is a lot of depth for Inomox. There is a lot of stuff that you can learn. There is actually pretty good documentation. And if you want to le learn more about that, then I can suggest you two great resources. One of them if you go to my site, there is Hibernate in Rhino, Rhinos here. This is a list of screencasts. This is an hour-long screencast that takes you throughout all the common things that you can do with Rhinomox. Give you the scenario, give you the solution. Scenario, solution, including commentary. We have the documentation here for just about everything. Okay, uh, it's Sinomox, and I think you can also access this directly. It's a huge amount of documentation about everything that you want to know. And with that, any final questions? Nothing. Okay, thank you very much.